morning to all i welcome you today today to this clinical meet student clinical meet today's first case will be presented by dr chandana i request dr chandana to present her first case respected faculty members seniors and my dear friends very good morning to all today in this student student clinical meet i am going to present a case series of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia so coming to the first case a 40 year old fe unmarried female presented with complaints of blurring of vision and altered mental sensorium for one day coming to the background history 2013 she presented to a local hospital with acute onset shortness of breath for which ctpa was done which was suggestive of thrombus in the main pulmonary artery extending to the left and right pulmonary artery for which she underwent catheter directed thrombolysis at cmc ludhiana and discharged on tap acetrom she continued on tab acetrom till 2018 then she was shifted to tab dabigat and 150 mg bd as per the physician's advice later on 2019 she developed pain and swelling in the left lower limb for which compression usg was done suggestive of dvt in the left lower limb again she underwent catheter directed thrombolysis for the same at ivy hospital and anticoagulation with dabigat and was continued but even in anticoagulation at current presentation she presented with blurring of vision and altered mental sensorium for one day again admitted initially in the ivy hospital where mri was done which was suggestive of subacute brain infarct in the right cerebellar hemisphere and hence she was referred to pgi on examination she was hemodynamically stable pallor was present otherwise uh, on cns examination she had sixth nerve palsy on the left side and cerebellar signs were present on the right side and fundus examination showed bilateral grade 5 papilledema with peripapillary hemorrhages on investigation routine investigation showed anemia and thrombocytopenia rest of the investigation were normal in view of young female with recurrent thrombosis possibility of apla was kept and workup was sent and which came out to be positive in high titers so the primary diagnosis was made as primary anti phospholipid antibody syndrome as she was negative for ana and anca coming to the case 2 41 year old male with no prior comorbidities present with complaints of pain abdomen fever and jaundice for 20 days on examination he had oxygen requirement and pallor and icteris was present rest of the examinations were within normal limits routine investigation showed anemia with indirect hi hyperbilirubinemia and in conjugation with uh, hemolytic workup we reached a conclusion of hemolytic anemia and he had thrombocytopenia also and his thrombophilia thrombophilia workup was sent in view of unprovoked thrombosis but his apla was negative twice and the imaging studies showed uh, segmental and subsegmental pt as well as hepatosplenic infarct with thrombosis in the celiac tract branches rest of the investigation showed scrub igm positive and anti paratus cell antibody positive and his mcv was also 156 on the ba background of hemolytic anemia as well as thrombosis we reached a diagnosis of pernicious anemia with extravascular hemolysis pulmonary thromboembolism hepatosplenic infarct with scrub typhus infection case 3 coming to the background history 2017 a 88 year old female presented with headache and vomiting for 3 days on examination she was hemodynamically stable her cns examination was unremarkable except for the decreased visual acuity in bilateral eyes and fundus examination showed bilateral papilledema her mri brain with mr venogram was done which showed superior sagittal sinus left lateral and sigmoid sinus thrombosis with features of intracranial hypertension since a young female present with unprovoked thrombosis thrombophilia workup was done which was showed heterozygous mth fr gene mutation for cvt she was started on enoxaparin initially which was bridge warfarin she remained asymptomatic till 2020 when she stopped warfarin by herself her current presentation in 2021 again present with complaints of headache and vomiting examination was unremarkable routine investigation showed anemia with thrombocytopenia with the pbf showing schistocytes so a possibility of ttp was kept and adamtius 13 levels was sent and the gene and the gene mutation was positive for adamtius 13 heterozygous so a diagnosis of hereditary thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura with a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis was made now coming to the discussion part what do we need to know about thrombosis coming to the definition of thrombosis it's a formation of blood clot within the blood vessel whether arterial or venous 
limiting the natural flow of blood, resulting in clinical sequelae. Together, acute arterial and venous thrombosis constitute the most common cause of death in developed countries. In our uh, human body, we have factors which favor thrombosis as well as inhibit thrombosis. Normally, there is a balance between these two factors which maintains a normal hemostasis. Coming to the approach to thrombosis, Coming to the approach to thrombosis, whenever we, whenever we approach a case of thrombosis, we should follow a stepwise manner. That is, first one is the history and physical examination. During history and physical examination, we get information about the site, the arterial or venous, whether it is arterial or venous, the extent of thrombosis, the preference and tolerability of anticoagulation in the patient. But the most important factor is to assess the risk factors for thrombosis in the history and physical examination. Coming to the risk factors for thrombosis, it is actually, it can be explained in terms of Wurzhoff triad. We have endothelial injury, circulatory status, and hypercoagulable state. Arterial thrombosis are mainly caused by the endothelial injury, whereas venous thrombosis are mainly caused by risk factors including circulatory stasis and hypercoagulable states. Then the second step is to determine the extent and site of thrombosis. Even though after history and physical examination, we get a brief idea about the extent as well as whether it is arterial or venous, we have to confirm for this we need an imaging modality. And then the third step is to find out the etiology of thrombosis. Coming to the etiology of arterial thrombosis, we have a wide array of etiology, but the major, most important cause of arterial thrombosis, atherosclerosis or embolism, or the metabolic abnormalities, then autoimmune causes and thrombophilias, including antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Coming to the etiology of venous thrombosis, when we discuss the etiology of venous thrombosis, it will be easy when we cons if we consider the site of thrombosis, because we have to look for the local factors as well as some of the important causes which produces thrombosis at specific site. For example, if a patient present with acute Bacchiari syndrome, we should always rule out myeloproliferative disorder in that patient. Then coming to the routine investigation, hemoglobin and hematocrit can give valuable clues to the diagnosis. For example, thrombotic events are well documented in patients with primary erythrocytosis, but not in patients with secondary erythrocytosis. Microcyto microcytic anemia is also associated with increased risk of venous thrombosis. Macrocytic or megaloblastic anemia due to vitamin B12 and folate deficiency liquid leads to acute hyperhomocystinemia causing thrombosis. Now, thrombosis and thrombocytopenia. Uh, the causes include antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis, disseminated intravascular coagulation, aplastic anemia with PNH, vaccine induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia, TTP or HUS, or hematological malignancy, mainly APML. When do we need to work up for thrombophilia? We have inherited as well as acquired cause of thrombo thrombophilia, but we need not have to evaluate for every patient for thrombophilia. So when to suspect thrombophilia? When a patient present with purpura fulminans or idiopathic or recurrent venous thromboembolism or first episode of venous thromboembolism at a younger age, a family history of venous thromboembolism, venous thrombo thrombosis in unusual vascular territory or vas warfarin-induced skin necrosis. This is an approach for thrombophilia, in short. In this figure, we can see that for every patient, we need to do a history and physical examination and a complete blood count. And applies are actually, uh, we can do in almost all cases, but the inherited thrombophilia, like protein CS deficiency, factor V laden, or antithrombin 3 deficiency should all, only be done in unprovoked VT or provoked by weak triggers with a fam strong family history of VT or in recurrent cases of venous thromboembolism. For all cases, age-appropriate scan cancer screening is mandatory, but serum homocysteine level is not recommended 
Now, for any of the case of thrombolysis, thrombosis. So, when to work for thrombophilia in short, when a patient present with initial DVT or pulmonary embolism, if it is provoked DVT, there is no indication for testing for thrombophilia, but if it is unprovoked, we can consider testing. And in case of recurrent DVT or P, even if it is provoked, we if it is provoked, we do not need to do thrombophilia workup, but in unprovoked recurrent DVT, we need to do the thrombophilia workup. In arterial thrombosis, thrombophilia workup is not recommended, whereas in unprovoked uh, splanchnic gonadal or cerebral venous thrombosis, we can consider testing thrombophilia at the initial visit. Association between inherited thrombotic disorders and arterial thrombosis is not well characterized. In young patient with arterial thrombosis, testing of inherited thrombophilia is only after extensive evaluation for other causes. So guidelines regarding testing for homocysteine and MTHFR mutation. So several studies showed lowering of homocysteine is not associated with the decrease in the risk of thrombosis. So we suggest not to test without other clinical signs as it will frequently reveal modest elevations with no clinical significance. And in the absence of elevated homocysteine levels, MTHFR mutations have no clinical significance and so there is no indication for performing the genetic test. So now when we can perform the thrombophilia test, that is if the patient present in an acute state or the patient is on anti anticoagulants, can we perform all the investigation? The answer is no. We can only perform antiphospholipid antibodies and the factor V laden mutation if the patient is in an acute state or if the patient is on any anticoagulation therapy. Now coming to management of thrombosis, it can be divided into three stages. We have an initial management phase which will last for 5 to 21 days. Then we have a primary treatment which will last for 3 to 6 months. Then a secondary prevention phase. The classification of drug includes anticoagulants, antiplayer drugs and thrombolytics among which anticoagulants are mostly used in venous thrombosis, whereas antiplayer drugs are mainly used in arterial thrombosis. Now, antiphospholipid syndrome and thrombocytopenia. Thrombocytopenia may be a symptom of antiphospholipid syndrome, and paradoxically, it can re refer to an elevated thrombotic tendency. The causes of thrombocytopenia and antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, it can be either due to increased platelet activation and destruction or decreased platelet production. When to treat thrombocytopenia in APS? In case of severe thrombocytopenia with increased bleeding risk, steroids or immunoglobulins can be used to treat increase the platelet count. Thrombocytopenia in SLE associated antiphospholipid syndrome or catastrophic APLA should be treated with high dose glucocorticoids, IVIG or immunosuppressive agents or plasma exchange. So whether to start NOAX or warfarin in APS? So we have a trial called TRAPS, that is a trial of rivaroxaban in antiphospholipid syndrome. It is a prospective randomized non-inferiority study conducted in Italy, among which 120 patients were randomized, and the outcome events were thromboembolism while on drugs. So the outcome was two in six patients on DOACs and six in 109 patients on warfarin. So we prefer to use warfarin in antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Now pernicious anemia and thrombosis. There, were, there are several case reports of venous thrombosis in the setting of vitamin B12 deficiency. B12 deficiency has two important components. It has a prothrombotic potential as well as microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Both were present in our patient. And thrombotic potential is due to the increase in homocysteine levels associated with B12 deficiency. So coming to the treatment and follow-up of our patient. Case 1, primary antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. She was started initially on low-dose low molecular heparin in view of severe thrombocytopenia. Then she received single dose of IVIG followed by her platelet increased to 1.2 lakhs. Then she was started on inoxaparin in full dose and then bridged with warfarin. And currently she is on warfarin 4MG once daily dosing and there is no further episodes of thrombosis. Second case, pernicious anemia with scrub typhus infection. Started on therapeutic dose of inoxaparin bridged with warfarin after five days. Injectable and oral vitamin B12 and folate supplements were added. And on follow-up, the repeat investigation showed normal HB and platelets with a normal bilirubin, and there was no further episodes of thrombosis or evidence of hemolysis. And third case, hereditary TTP. She received eight sessions of plasma exchange followed by oral steroids. Currently, she is on tapering dose of oral steroids. So take home message, whenever we encounter a patient of thrombosis, approach in a stepwise manner as mentioned. Do not go for thrombophilia workup upfront unless indicated. 
Testing for homocysteine and MTHFR mutations are no longer recommended. Warfarin is the preferred anticoagulant in APS. Thrombocytopenia need not be treated in APS before anticoagulation unless it is secondary to SLE, ITP or catastrophic EPLA. Thank you.